road trip, baby. Come on, guys, let's get in. It's time to go. I'm feeling okay, shotgun. Well, we're still on our road trip here for our summer series at PCC. A literal road trip today with an incredibly important, even if it's a familiar story from the Bible, one that I hope will have new meaning for all of us in the next few minutes. Where I am right now is also relevant. It's a place that is the perfect place to talk about today's road trip scripture we sometimes like to take our whole church on a field trip, a road trip, if you will, to a place where only a few of us can go. So allow God to speak to you today from the other side of the planet. Welcome to Tanzania. by your beautiful landscape here in Tanzania. We believe that God called us across an ocean and across a culture to be with you. And we're honored to be with you, worshiping God with you today. It was an ordinary day for Cameron. He was 20 years old, he was a student, and he made his way down the steps at the New York City subway, and he waited for the train. But something went horribly wrong. A violent seizure attacked his body, and Cameron collapsed to the ground, and he was disoriented. He managed to get up somehow, and he walked over to the platform where he collapsed a second time. This time, he fell into the railway bed right at the moment 
when uh, the roar of the next train announced the imminent arrival of what was bound to be, determined to be, sure to be his lethal moment. And we can imagine, right, how some of the people in the subway reacted. It was filled with people. There were, there were the eye closers, right? The folks who, who just shut their eyes and refused to watch what was about to happen. And, and then there were the mannequins, you know, those people who completely froze, just unable to move, totally helpless. And then there were some people so focused on where they were going and what they were doing that they probably didn't even notice what was happening. They weren't even aware of it. In just a few seconds, this young man with dreams of his whole life in front of him was about to have his future cut short and no one could stop it. No one would stop it, except one person did. Wesley Autry was also there that day. He was traveling with his two daughters and he saw it happen, but he didn't close his eyes and he didn't freeze, and he didn't just keep going with whatever he had to do. He did something really crazy. He jumped into the path of an oncoming train, and he covered Cameron's body with his own. In spite of the uncontrolled convulsions that Cameron was experiencing because of his seizure, uh, uh, Wesley stretched out his body on top of them both and pushed them into the ground while the deafening roar of a subway train traveled less than two inches above Wesley's back. Two full cars passed before the screeching brakes brought the train to a stop. And even then, and even then, the two men were underneath of the thing. So nobody could see them. Everybody believed they had been killed. Wesley's two young girls who watched the whole thing happen, they thought they had lost their dad. And to be sure, that could have happened. It probably should have happened, but it didn't. Underneath the tonnage of transportation, Wesley was unharmed and Cameron was still alive. Well, Wesley was given hero status, awards, invited to the White House to meet then President Bush. He made the rounds on all the big name talk shows and overnight he became a sensation. And when he was interviewed about this incident, Autry said that he saw the headlights of the train come around the corner and he knew he, he had just a second to make an irrevocable decision. And this is what he said, and I quote, he said, I don't feel like I did anything spectacular. I just saw someone who needed help. He said, I did what I felt was right. And then he concluded like this. He said, you're supposed to come to people's rescue. To be true to the story, now Wesley, he made no reference to the Bible or teachings of Jesus that I know of, but his conclusion would certainly be cheered by Jesus. You're supposed to come to people's rescue. That's exactly what Jesus was trying to get at in today's road trip story. I believe that God wants all of us to care that much, even about people we don't know. And maybe we won't all end up with our lives hovering two inches below to a, a speeding subway car. But the question is, do you and I care enough to put ourselves in harm's way, whatever that looks like? You can't train yourself to behave that way. You have to train your soul to love that way. So here's the setup to the story. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This guy, he had no idea he was about to learn a lesson on caring for others. He thinks he's having a conversation about ideas. He thinks he is in a philosophical debate. He has no clue that Jesus is about to throw him into the path of an oncoming train. What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. In Matthew, another book in the Bible, we read that Jesus declares these two things to be the greatest commandments, to love God and to love your neighbor, to love God and to love your neighbor. So this guy's intellectual answer is actually right. If, if he was taking a written test, he would not only pass, he'd get an A+. Plus. But I want you to note the subtle statement that Jesus makes that should completely change the way that we think. He says, do this and you will live. In other words, saying that you should love God and love your neighbor is nice and all, 
It's just completely meaningless. Actually doing those things, that is life-giving. But the conversation isn't over. The man wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You ever set someone up in a conversation like you baited them and hoped they would take the bait? Susan and I have this game we play about her haircuts. She gets her hair done and waits to see how long it will take for me to notice. Usually there are like a dozen people who say, I really like your hair to her before I realize that she's had a haircut. So I, I try to lie my way out of it. I'm just confessing here. Oh, honey, I, I did notice. But, but you were on the phone with your mom. I didn't want to interrupt you. Or I was just so stunned by how you could possibly get even more beautiful that I was literally speechless, which of course she calls me on. Now, since we share calendars, I just have her calendar talk to my calendar and alert me when her haircut appointment happens. Jesus sets this guy up. He knew the guy was going to ask the question, who's your neighbor? This is a battle of the minds. And for the record, you never want to go head to head against Jesus. Who is my neighbor? The guy asks. And Jesus cracks half a smile. The guy is dying a thousand deaths in this war of of ideas and wits with God himself, he just doesn't know it. I imagine Jesus whispers under his breath, well, I'm glad you asked. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. From Jerusalem to Jericho. Now these are intentional. Jesus uses them on purpose. They're very important to the story. From Jerusalem tells us that this guy who's traveling, he's Jewish. And in Jesus's day, the Jewish people were under forced Roman rule. And because of that, they were, it was necessary for them to take care of each other. They were supposed to take care of each other. So for whatever reason, this Jewish man decides to travel to Jericho, the oldest, hottest, wildest town in all of Israel. And the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, it was called the bloody road because of thieves and, and criminals who waited in the shadows for travelers to come along. It was that part of town, you know, the part that you and I, we know about. It's that section or that area that we all know is dangerous and we all avoid it, right? The Jericho Road, even in broad daylight, was extremely dangerous. So this man, uh, Jesus says he was headed down and that's also important because the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was rocky and hilly and especially steep because you dropped about a thousand feet in elevation on the trip. Here in Tanzania, we've been on some crazy roads. I'm talking miles and miles, endless dirt roads, minus the roads, where the bus carrying the 13 Americans winds its way through villages filled with the poorest people that most of us can ever imagine. Most people here hope to find a way to make a dollar a day and they don't always succeed. Many go without food. They wash their clothes in an old sheetrock bucket because there's no running water in their house if if you could call it that. Oh, and that, that bucket that, that they wash their clothes in, it also doubles as the food carrier for whatever meal they can feed their kids. Four posts with wood planks tacked together and a tarp for a roof and a dirt floor with a curtain on the front. The roads we've traveled here led us to people with one set of clothes, the ones they were wearing. The kids make soccer balls out of plastic bags, tightly bound together, it's their only toy. And they build their own tools like rakes and ladders. And whatever building they do, they do by hand. There are no power tools here. And oh yeah, when they clear a lot so they can plant some food, they do it with a shovel and a one wheel wheelbarrow. They make their own bricks out of clay, brick by brick, one at a time. And mothers load their children on their backs while carrying things on their heads and loads with their arms. They cook meals outside over open fires, no microwaves here. And all of us, we drove to church today, griping about the slow driver in front of us, but the church I spoke at here, most of the people who came walked for two hours to get to church, and they walked for two hours to get back home. 
The road here is hard. Life here is hard. And it's not just a fact for us to ignore. I mean, back to the scripture, Jesus is giving us a parable and a parable is a fictitious story intended to reveal a spiritual truth. So this hypothetical man is traveling on the road to Jericho and he's attacked. I mean, they beat him. They took his clothes off. They left him naked and half dead. And then a priest comes by. Priests were people who were born into the Jewish priesthood from, from Jewish tradition and the pages of the Hebrew Bible. Priests were appointed by God through their family heritage. And they did priestly things like you would expect. They, they said prayers and sacrifices and rituals. They were responsible for overseeing religious ceremonies that you would expect like marriages and dedications and funerals. But they were mostly set apart so they could take care of their people. And the priest in this parable, he sees this badly injured fellow Jew and he crosses the street and keeps walking. A few minutes later, a Levite comes along. A Levite is similar to a priest. He, he just had some more mundane tasks in addition to some priestly duties. Still, the, the, the Levite is fully Jewish. And the guy in the ditch who's hurting is a brother. So the Levite sees him lying there, hurting, bleeding, badly in need, and he crosses the street and keeps walking. Of course, this is a parable, right? It didn't really happen. But Jesus tells parables to reveal truth. And the truth is, this does happen. There are people all around us in need, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in communities nearby and around the world. In America, it's easy to walk to the other side of the road and avoid the people who need help. And let's, we've got to be honest about this seriously. We literally avoid areas where people need help with interstates and roads that just go around them. I understand the priest and the Levite. It's part of why I, I, I have to push myself to go beyond my comfort and get outside of my bubble and come to places like here, places near our home and far away, to be reminded that people need help and I'm supposed to help them. It's why our church this year sent 100 plus students and, and adults to Walterboro, South Carolina to help people in need. It's why we have do good projects around every campus to help people in need. It's why your church helps hundreds of people with food and shelter and, and heating in the winter or all around Virginia. It's why we went to Fort Myers, Florida earlier this year to help people after a hurricane catastrophe. It's why a team went to Belize and a group is in the Amazon. It's why there's a team here in Tanzania. Speaking of Tanzania, our focus here is Save Life English Medium School, which is really an oasis in the middle of poverty and hunger and hopelessness. The founder of this school has been to PCC. His name is Lupi, and he's an incredible visionary who's made a tremendous sacrifice to help kids here. He started the school in 2017 with a raw piece of land and a massive dream. Today, just six years later, there are nearly 300 kids coming to this school, 41 of whom are orphans and come here for free. Here, they drilled the only well in the entire area. They built a fish farm where they raise 5,000 fish to eat. They grow their own vegetables. They milk their own cows. They carefully harvest their own firewood so they can cook. Loopy takes no salary, but he did take in 15 orphans to live with him because they had nowhere else to go. He has a small farm and he, he uses most of the harvest for food at the school, but he sells some of it, carrying it to market on the back of his motorcycle, which is the only vehicle that he has. I come here and I'm stunned. I'm amazed at the sacrifice that some of these people here make to help others. It's convicting truly. And I wonder if this is the kind of love Jesus had in mind when he finished his parable. Remember now, the priest and the Levite left their fellow Jew on the side of the road, badly wounded. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he took the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Here's where it gets even more interesting and convicting, frankly. Samaritans were hated by Jewish people. I mean hated. 
when the Assyrians conquered Israel in 722 BC, they took a bunch of Jewish people from their Jewish community and they exported them and forced them to live somewhere else. Then they took a bunch of people over here in this community, the Assyrian community, and they brought them in to where the other Jews remained. And over time, what happened was natural. They intermarried. And that was a cardinal sin for Jews in Jesus' day. So pure blood Jewish people looked at their half-blood Jewish brothers and sisters in Samaria like they were half-blood, which was almost worse than no blood. They were despised and unwanted and disowned. A Jew would never talk to a Samaritan, and Samaritans hated them for it. So after his own people ignore his beaten, bloody body, the Samaritan comes along, and we expect him to walk by. I mean, after all, the Jew wouldn't help him if he was the one in the ditch. But the unthinkable happens. The one person who's supposed to be the enemy, the guy with tainted blood, who was supposed to and expected to, within his right, leave the guy in the ditch, he not only stops, but he risks being attacked by the very criminals who were probably still around. And he uses his scarce resources to dress the wounds, and he lifts the guy up and puts him on his own donkey, and he puts him up at the hotel at his own expense, and he guarantees any cost with his own credit and he promises to return and check on him. I mean, who does that? A person who cares, that's all. And that's the story of the parable. The lesson Jesus is trying to teach all of us today, the characteristic that God wants all of us to have, caring is more than words, it's action. But the action comes from something in here. It begins in here. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers, Jesus asked. The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. What does that mean? Well, I think it means risk and sacrifice. Risk and sacrifice. There's no safe way to help somebody in need or to show them that you care. Not really. One day while we were here, we had a little extra time and I asked our hosts if they would take us to see some crocodiles. And so they took us to this bridge, if you could call it a bridge. It was this rickety patchwork of old planks and wire and fencing that bounced as we hung tentatively 50 feet above the muddy river, where supposedly hiding below the surface were some of Earth's most ancient and vicious reptiles. And we never saw any crocodiles, but what we did see was a woman trying to push her bike, which was completely loaded with supplies, up this hill, and she was struggling. So the two 15-year-olds on our trip, Levi and Sebastian, they decided to help her. They pushed her bike, what we thought was just up to the top of this little hill, and so as they started pushing, the rest of us turned around to continue our search for the elusive crocodiles. A few minutes later, someone said, hey, where's Levi and Sebastian? And we all shrugged our shoulders as we realized that they never came back. So we tried to call them, but there was no cell phone signal. Panicking now, our anxiety rising, we all jumped into the bus. We raced in the direction that we had last seen them go. And the more we drove, the more worried we got. In fact, Josh Bartlam, our videographer, finally jumped out of the bus to fly the drone to see if we could spot them from the sky. It shouldn't be that hard. They were the only two white teenagers anywhere. But just before liftoff, we saw those two kids in the distance. They had pushed that woman's bike and all of her belongings all the way to her home with little thought to how they would find their way back. When we found them, Levi said in true teenage fashion, he said, I'm 15 years old. You don't have to worry about me. <laughs> Here's the truth. There's no way around this, by the way. They actually were in some danger, at least a little. In a faraway place, they didn't speak the language. Their passports were on the bus, not with them. And I'm not saying we would do it the same way next time. We wouldn't. We would take better precautions. But what they did illustrates Jesus' point. Instead of crossing the road to avoid the person who needed help, Levi and Sebastian traveled the road with her, danger notwithstanding. Remember how this conversation started before the parable, the man asked Jesus, what he's got to do to be right with God. And Jesus replies, well, love your neighbor and love God. 
And the man looking to win a spiritual argument with a legal loophole, he asks the, te the technical definition of a neighbor. And I've studied this text, you know, the, the thousandth time this week getting ready for today. And I realized that Jesus wasn't trying to define neighbor here. He was trying to define me. He was trying to show me what it looks like to care regardless of who's in need. Practically speaking, as I peeled back the layers, I kept seeing that the one who really cares risks and sacrifices. In other words, care has a cost. And if you're not willing to pay the price, it might just be a soul issue for you. I'll show you how this practically played out for me in just a minute, but I, I just want to reiterate here that the hero in the parable is the guy that nobody expects to help, but he does. How does he help? He sacrifices his personal money. He puts his credit on the line by telling the innkeeper that he'll cover all the expenses. He sacrifices his time. I mean, we don't know what he's doing, but he's going somewhere for some reason. It's not like he's sitting there thinking, man, I just can't wait till there's a crisis and I can help somebody in need. I finally understood that the good Samaritan was just like you and me. He was busy. He's on his way to something he was supposed to attend. He had a schedule to keep just like you and me. But care took priority over calendar and he stopped what he was doing so that he could help. Risk and sacrifice. That's what defines the Good Samaritan. Those qualities are what God wants to define us to. People here seem to do it naturally. They give up what little they have to care for people around them. And I'm convinced, frankly, that we don't do enough of that, that I don't do enough of that. So while I'm here, I met this little girl named Penel. She's albino in a culture that often treats this rare pigmentation anomaly like a spiritual curse, Re really, literally. Outside of Save Life English Medium School, Penel is shunned and bullied and mistreated. Oh, and she's also an orphan and she's special needs. She stood out to me, not just because of her skin color, but because I don't really know why, but my heart broke for her. And so I, I talked with my wife, Susan, who's here with me. And, and I asked Loopy, the leader of the school, I said, can Susan and I take care of Penel? We wanna make sure she's fed and clothed and has glasses and, and we wanna pay for her schooling. Is that a sacrifice for me? Yes, it is. But let's face it, I'm still going home to my remote controls, my climate control, my cruise control. The team who came here with me came to help build the next classroom for this school, and that work is happening behind me now. We also came to meet kids at this school, to play with them, to get to know them, to do a, a mega camp with them, to build relationships and remind them that they're not alone. And most importantly, we came to tell these kids that Jesus loves them. We got to teach them that, many of them hearing that message for the very first time in their entire lives. And along the way, we fell in love with them too. That's what happens when you care. When you risk and you sacrifice, it leads to love. I wanna remind you today that Jesus' command to go and do likewise, it's not limited to parables and missionaries. It's a command for every one of his followers. If you are a follower of Jesus here today, you cannot ignore this. You are called to be the Good Samaritan with people around you where we live, people in need, and people around the world in need too. Soon, you'll have a chance to be a part of a Do Good project around your campus. Soon, you'll have the chance to sign up for next year's trip to Moldova or Belize or Tanzania one of our three mission partners there. Soon you'll have the chance to sign up for a do-good trip to a storm-ravaged place in the United States. Soon you'll have the chance to join students and go on their annual mission trip. Soon you'll have the chance to sponsor a child through PCC in one of the three places around the world where we go. I'm committed to making that happen. So let's up our personal sacrifice. Let's take the risk for people who need help so that you and I can go and do likewise. Lord, take us beyond what our eyes can see, what our hearts can dream. We want everything you offer us. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done. It's time to go where we have never gone. Take us beyond.
forever raised to the one that we pursue. May our obedience leave fingerprints and let the world know it was you. May our highest praise be forever raised to the one that we pursue. May our obedience leave fingerprints and let the world know it was you. We want everything that God wants for us, and we want the world to know that we do it all for His glory and for His name. So let's commit to doing what Brian said. Don't be afraid of the risk or the sacrifice it takes to care for others, because it will lead us to love, the kind of love that Jesus wants for us. Now, if you're ready to put Jesus' command to go and do likewise into action, you can start right now by signing up to do good. There are people in need in the communities at every one of our campuses and all you have to do is get out your phone and scan this QR code to let us know that you're interested in helping and to get signed up for an opportunity to do good with one of our teams. So thank you again for being here today, and I hope you'll come back next week as we continue our road trip series. We'll see you then.